What does it take to make a family? Well, children, of course, brothers, sisters. And on that note, have you ever thought that Christ might be calling you to be his brother or sister? Priests have many temporal duties demanding their attention. But to be a consecrated brother is to perform a sacred supporting role that's really been long established by the church, unfortunately too long neglected. We did not join together. I was three years ahead. We both went to college for, I went for one year and Brother Patrick finished his degree. And I decided that I should discern a religious vocation because I didn't think that working for money was really that satisfying. So I th and I was very intrigued by the religious life in high school and had spent some time with the brothers and decided I liked it. So I said, well, I'll try that first. And then I went to St. Benedict Center here and never left. I lived, was brought up right after the council <clears throat> in that atmosphere. I saw all the changes, but I never witnessed a guitar mass until I went to the seminary. And uh, they were quite disturbing, always distracting. And, and sometimes I would not go to Holy Communion because it was just so unsettling. Things were just changing a little too quickly, too, a little too fast. And I thought, well, I might have some things straight, but there's a lot I have to learn. And, and I don't want to put myself in that position where I could lose the faith. I thought, well, I might not become a priest, but at least I'll go to a place where the faith is being held. And so I joined three years later, after graduation from college, and it was sort of the same thing where there was this um, dissatisfaction, this empty feeling for working out in the world, and here working directly for God gives you a focus and a higher motivation for doing whatever you're doing, no matter how small the task may seem. So that was uh, one of my driving motives for coming here. And um, since then, God's grace has been in action for all these past years, and it's been definitely satisfying to see. Take a hard look at yourself, at your life and work so far. You may be a success, as the world measures success, but that world that you live in has been darkened by sin, while Christ's one true church has been broken by scandal. In the time that we live in right now, many of the faithful have grown hostile to the church and to our truths. They really need a family to restore them, that family environment. They need a father, a mother, our father, our blessed mother, and sisters and brothers. Consider what it means to be a consecrated brother devoted to the loving support of Christ's human family here on earth, and then his mystical body, which is our church. The life of total consecration to God uh, can take on various forms, and the, the life of consecration as a priest requires the seminary, the seminary training, in preparation for a sacrament. So you're receiving the sacrament of holy orders when you go on to the priesthood. A brother is actually called a lay brother. We're, we're, we're not laity in the sense of we're not religious, but we're, we, we are laity in the sense that we don't take orders, the, the holy orders. And so that leads us with a little bit of more freedom in terms of uh, the kind of work that we do and, and so forth, and the kind of life that we lead in terms of our, our daily routine and the, and the like. So in other words, we're not bound in this community, we're not bound to the divine office. So there's some major differences there. But the main difference is that one is on track for receiving the actual sacrament of holy orders, and that in itself is a unique calling, and then the other is not. Nevertheless, it is still a consecration to God. It's a vocation that is really needed, and especially in terms of teaching. And this is why our community is, is so essential in terms of uh, establishing again these, these traditional Catholic schools, and with the help of God, uh, we'll continue on that, that path. I like to think of the brothers as the support troops for the priests and that the priests they um, are the ones who are responsible for giving Christ to others in a way through the sacraments whereas the everyone gives Christ to others through their example but the, as a brother here and especially as a teacher you're able to 
encounter quite a few individuals over the years. And that is a special, a special grace, I think, where you're almost the father of a family year after year after year for different groups of, different groups of kids. And um, in that sense, I enjoy that aspect of the vocation and encountering them. And priesthood, the priesthood is a definitely uh, an elevated calling. Like you wouldn't just rush into the priesthood. You could try religious life and try out a few orders um, and see how you like each one. But for priesthood, you definitely have to be called by God because none of us are worthy of becoming a priest. It's definitely a calling. None of us are worthy to become brothers or sisters, but it, we are called by God. So that special grace and urge and upbringing has to be there in order to be, join the priesthood. And for brothers, it is not as lofty as the priesthood, but still enriching both for our, us here at St. Benedict Center and for all bro religious brothers, as well as for uh, those around us. Being, as Brother mentioned, being able to touch so many lives has really been a transformative part of our life as well. Yeah, it's quite a blessing. Being a brother is a great, is a great privilege. It's a great calling. I mean, <clears throat> St. Bernard believes that uh, a blessed mother was meditating on Isaiah 7:14 when the angel appeared to her to announce her becoming the mother of God. And he believes that she was meditating on that, thinking, if I could only be the handmaid of that virgin, what a great privilege that would be. Little did she think she would be that virgin. And uh, here it is, we have the opportunity to be the slaves of that beautiful woman. We are serving her, and that's, that's a great privilege we should never take for granted. It's a great calling. You look at St. Joseph, he was a simple, humble man. He was really of noble, <clears throat> noble birth. He was of the line of David, but he wasn't, uh, God didn't choose him to be a king, but to be, uh, you know, the guardian, the chaste spouse of the Blessed Mother and the guardian of our Lord. Um, and that, that's the greatest privilege anyone I think could ever have. So. Uh, everyone has their special calling, and I think as far as vocations go, people, young people should uh, ask God what He wants them to do. We all have a special place in God's plan. And, and uh, being, being a slave of the Blessed Virgin Mary is a great, uh, great privilege. The slaves here in Still River operate a school, chapel, and gymnasium and even a bookstore and a summer camp up in the woods of New Hampshire. They have devoted their lives to the education and formation, mind, body, and soul, all encompassed, of the Catholic children in their charge, and also the support of the parents as well. This is a crisis in Catholic education because now that we've lost a lot of the teaching nuns and religious, uh, they're run by lay people, and lay people have to be paid. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna be raising families. That's another problem because then all of a sudden um, tuitions are high. We're really only able to educate the the more wealthy, um, so it's very difficult. And that's one of the another beautiful things about Immaculate Heart of Mary School is that the tuition is low. It's taught by religious. So we can really reach out to those families that have been somewhat um, abandoned by the church. Um, families that are trying to be truly Catholic uh, by being um, true to their moral principles of, of marriage and having larger families and, uh, and making that wonderful sacrifice. And so we feel it's a wonderful opportunity for us not to abandon them in their, in their Catholic pursuits. We give the kids the traditional Latin Mass and the Rosary um, as opposed to the New Rite, uh, just so that they can um, have something that means something to them. Give them, give them the truth, give them the, uh, the most beautiful, the most perfect. The liturgy isn't something that you just manufacture. You just say, okay, what are we gonna do today? No, the liturgy is something that's developed from the Last Supper right through centuries 
of a beautiful, uh, the minds of liturgists such as uh, Gregory the Great, who died in 604, and all of these, these contributions to liturgy, adding to the beauty of liturgy, adding to the, the, the meaningfulness of what it is to celebrate the sacraments and so forth, and uh, to just discard them for a whim, so it seemed, uh, was totally disastrous to the church, as we've already seen. We've seen the results of this. Try and uphold what, what Father Feeney laid down and what Brother you uh, upheld. And that was to be um, completely orthodox in our faith, not to go after the, 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 all these changes, novelties, uh, to study the fathers of the church, study the doctors and the popes, what they wrote, um, keep the liturgy intact. I think that's what a lot of people are looking for, a lot of young people today. Um, there's so much confusion in the church, I think they're looking for stability, looking for tradition, the way it's always been. I think God wants tradition, and uh, I think they, the people have to say, where can I go where the faith is, I'm going to keep the faith, I'm not going to be influenced to unorthodox teaching and to heresy. There's so much heresy even being taught in the seminary today. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, that's displeasing to God. And we hear so many attacks on uh, the doctrines of the faith today. And that's why we have so much confusion in the church, sad to say. Along with the rule of St. Benedict, Daily life also calls for a total consecration to our Blessed Mother, in community with the brothers and sisters. So we have, again, the combination of the monastic and the active life. Benedict is the father of Western monasticism, so his whole idea was the rule. And so you, uh, ora et labora, work and prayer. And so their lives were dedicated to the reciting of the, or the singing of the divine office. And uh, they're also, they were great scholars. They were the ones who established universities in Europe and so forth. So that's what we have in terms of, uh, of the, the daily schedule. We're not, we're not monastic in that sense, but we follow a rule. And this is, comes from the idea what Benedict had. Then as far as our spirituality, it's more than a devotion. Total consecration to Mary is not just another devotion to Mary. It's a total consecration. It's a total giving of oneself to the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, and to, to Jesus through Mary. And so this, every, everything that we do uh, is centered around this total giving of ourselves to Mary, not just the exterior practices, and as good as they are, the rosary and so forth, but also the, the interior practices, doing everything, as St. Louis de Montfort says, by with, in, and for the Blessed Virgin Mary, for the glory of her Son, Jesus Christ. When I came and I stayed with the brothers, and, you, and you're living basically a monastic life, then everything became very regimented, and that was good for me. And I think it's good for most men and most people to have that regimen. But as far as like spirituality and, and getting down to, you know, morning and evening prayers and meditation, what good books to read, um, you really have to make sure someone's on you uh, to, to get that type of formation in a family. Uh, one of the parents is just taking a real interest in that and not just the material aspects, you know. So the steps in our formation is a postulant for six months. And um, th then after two years, you go up to a novice, um, which is what Brother Lewis is at now. He just made his novitiate. And so basically a more intense study. Then you work up to your profession when you make your vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. So that's what you're, that's the big buildup is for poverty, chastity, and obedience, the vows. And a lot of people see those three vows as something negative, but when seen as something positive, they're just a means to a higher good. And so by poverty, we leave the things of the world, we exchange the world for God. By chastity, we exchange the love through the flesh to divine love. And by obedience, we give up our own will, which tends to lead to evil sometimes, 
or to just selfishness, we leave that behind for obedience to God. So it's all, when seen in a positive light, they're just rungs on the ladder that lead to something much, much better. There's, oh, there's always going to be something you miss from where you've been, usually, for most people. Um, but any challenging step you take, or any worthwhile step you take, demands sacrifice. People who join the military leave a lot behind. People who get married leave something behind. People who go to different countries for various reasons, even if it's just a study abroad, have left things behind. So yes, there's always that memory uh, that of what you left behind. But the rewards and what our Lord has asked of us should motivate us to take those challenges happily. Poverty, chastity, and obedience, those are all tools we use to not only sanctify ourselves, but sanctify the people around us. So the rewards, the benefits from those three vows are extremely, extremely sanctifying for us and for those around us. Poverty, chastity, and obedience go back to the Master, Jesus Christ. Okay, he's the poor man, he's the poor carpenter, he's chaste, he's single, and uh, he is the, the teacher of, of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Obedient to his heavenly father, obedient to his own parents, um, Joseph and Mary. And so, yes, it has a, a, an austerity that scares or maybe frightens people who don't know, you know, the, um, the real purpose for it. But, again, when we're talking about consecration to God, what could be better than to be detached from the things of this world? What could be more advantageous than, uh, than denying oneself you know, the goods of this world in poverty, uh, in imitation of Christ? What could be more beneficial spiritually than living a chaste life and then a life of obedience under the, the rule of a superior? It's, it reflects uh, Christ himself and his life on earth. The, someone told me, I forget who it was, but someone said, if you're discerning a religious vocation, you should look for generosity. Generosity. And in, all, in any aspect of life, or all aspects of life. But also uh, detachment. That's, that's a big thing. You're stepping away from a lot of things. And in modern day society, there are a lot of things to step away from. So if, are they able to detach themselves? Then that's material you can work with. And someone who considers a religious life should be very willing to work hard to attain the goal of perfection. So someone should be very willing to do all that it takes, which is difficult sometimes as we all learn, to, to pray, to meditate, and to really make themselves a better person. But that will, that desire to become a saint is really what should drive that person. A person who would like to become a slave of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and adopt this life has to be a person, first of all, of prayer, a person who is willing to make sacrifices, willing to take up the cross and follow our Lord in the preaching of the gospel because we're not just a monastic community, we are a very active community. And our, our, as our role here is to not only sanctify ourselves, but to glorify God and save souls. So I suppose you could say one who has deep faith, deep zeal, and is willing to make the sacrifices necessary uh, for self-denial and the life of uh, total consecration to Jesus through Mary. They have to be eager to learn, eager to work, eager to participate, and have a, have a good disposition, get along with people, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I never had any doubts <clears throat> for, you know, um, it's all God's grace, and uh, I never had any doubts about where God wanted me to be once I came. And uh, so it's been very, very peaceful life, really. You know, I have a lot of help from the, the community. I, it, perhaps when I was younger, I, I did think it might be hard to, uh, you look at the future and you say, it might be hard to persevere, but I never, never thought I couldn't. But I um, think the grace is there, you know. The Brothers of St. Benedict Center strive to be a bridge between monastery and parish, priesthood and laity, city, suburb, and countryside try to encapsulate everybody. 
Their work is hard, but fulfills them in Christ. It may well be the most important work, actually, being performed in the face of the modern crisis in the faith right now. Ask yourself if God is calling you to join them in their labor.